version five of our Lent explorations. I hope that you're beginning to see ways in which we can travel on the roads together and equally importantly, beginning to see what it might look like to be a community where the river flows. Our final pair of values, not final because they're least important, but perhaps final because they follow on from the others, are sharing generously and receiving abundantly. So as we start by thinking about what the Bible has to say about sharing and receiving, a few questions. First question, what is it that we're called to share? The first of the three readings that we used across our services on Sunday was from Genesis chapter 12, where God makes a covenant with Abram. And he promises to bless him and make him into a great nation and through him to bless all the peoples of the earth. That promise comes, of course, to final fruition in the gift of Jesus and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the church. And the idea is still the same as it was back then. We are called to be a blessing, to share what God gives, because that's the reason God gives it. We are always blessed in order to bless others. Second question then. But come on, that's all very well. What is it that we're really called to share? Because you can't touch love. You can't count blessing, however many times we might be encouraged to. You can't portion out your own experience of God's grace and goodness and measure parts of it to be given to other people. What does it mean in practice to share God's love and blessing? Well, we'll think a bit more about that in part three today. But our second reading from Sunday is from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, and it's all about an offering of money. I know, the last taboo. And of course, money can be a mixed blessing. But there is a part of this sharing that we are committing to that will require financial generosity. God has always asked his people to give and to share a proportion of their material wealth and for that to be both giving to the poor and to the faith community. I don't have time to preach a sermon on giving now, but I don't apologise for asking all of us to give of our money. Third question, who are we called to share with? Well, firstly, as I said, each other. And this doesn't consist of the giving that's picking and choosing the items and specific projects that we want to contribute to, but giving to the church, not because the institution needs to survive or because we want the church to do a specific thing with our money, but simply because we are the body of Christ. And even more importantly, because giving is our worship to God. I give to the church, not because I believe in the particular thing that the church I'm part of at the time happens to be doing, but because I want to say to God, this money is no longer mine. In fact, it was never mine, it's yours. And I want your people together to decide what to do with it. That is of course a big responsibility for those of us who are entrusted with the decisions about how the church spends its money. And we take that seriously and we need to be held accountable for it. But I sometimes think it's not as big a responsibility as I'd like it to be, because our levels of financial giving across the churches, in common with a lot of other parish churches, are not very high. But I promise not to preach about giving because there is more to these values than that. For a start, there's the second part to the who are we called to share with question. And that's found in Sunday's Gospel reading, where Jesus teaches about giving. In other places, Jesus says really normal things about giving, like be generous, don't show off about your giving. But in Luke 6, he says something outrageous. Share with your enemies. Give to those who've got nothing to give in return. We are called to share with everyone, actually, without distinction or calculation, because that is how God gives himself to us. We can offer him nothing and we will let him down. And yet he gave his life and he gives himself. We're called to share without working out how it benefits us. 
We're called to give to those who don't deserve it. We're called to a life of generosity towards those who can offer us nothing in return. Our generosity should be a sign, a sign that faces outwards. And we shouldn't expect to control or to be able to calculate how people will respond when they see that sign. But when we do give like this, Jesus says, what we give will be given back. In fact, many times over. That's why our values are the way round that they are. You might think it would make more sense to receive abundantly first and then share generously. And it's true that we have to receive from God before we can give, because otherwise we have nothing to share. The first act of giving was actually God's creating of the world. He started it. But what I really want us to embrace at this time is the truth that it is in giving and sharing that we then most receive. Not receive the fuzzy feeling of altruism or the mutual love of friends and family and the church, although those are all good. And definitely not the storing up of points to earn God's love because we can't do that. But the gift of God himself and the promise that he will reward us. We will then receive abundantly. That's what Jesus promises. That when we give, when we are generous, then we will overflow with blessing from God. So what does this have to do with being on the road together where the river flows? Well, let's start by recapping 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one of the passages that we looked at to think about unity and diversity a couple of weeks ago. It's all about the different gifts that God gives to the church, if you remember. They're all different, but all the gifts have one thing in common, or two if you count God. All the gifts are given for the benefit of the church, not for the benefit of the individual to whom they're given. Whatever gifts you have from God, they're not for you. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy the things and the people and the skills and the spiritual gifts that we have. Of course we can. But it does mean that generosity and sharing should be our first thought, not our last. And there's no way to pretend that that isn't hard. I imagine, in fact, I'm sure that some of the conversations in these explore groups have hit the reality of the clash between togetherness and the preferences of individuals or particular groups within our churches. To share generously does imply in English, let alone in Christian theology, that we give up things that we could choose to keep and that we do so not out of compulsion, but out of choice. This is deeply counterintuitive, it's deeply countercultural, and it's deeply annoying. And we won't be able to do it unless we grasp how abundantly God has blessed us and will bless us and how little we deserve it. Let me ask you, do you want to live godly lives? Do you want to be more like God? It's the first of our diocesan priorities, actually, becoming more like Christ. And I'm sure you will know that the correct answer to the question is yes. But do we actually want to be like him? He was shown to us most clearly in Jesus, and we know that Jesus wasn't always popular. We know he died on the cross. Also, we know that God's generosity is stupid. Think of some of the pictures of God's generosity in scripture, particularly some of the parables that Jesus told. The man who cancels the millions of pounds in debt. The man who pays labourers a day's wage for a few minutes work. And what about the sower? I mean, worst farmer ever. A farmer went out one day with seeds to sow and scattered it willy-nilly over mostly useless ground. And it's not even that he didn't have good soil. He did. Some of the seed went there, more by luck than judgment, it seems. Who wastes precious seed by dropping it on a path, or under thorn bushes, or on rocky ground? Nobody who's sensible, or competent, or responsible. Ah, 
But what if you had unlimited seed? Wouldn't you then throw it everywhere? Because you never know, it might grow. And some of it definitely will. And if the story is to be believed, some of it will bear fruit a hundredfold. At times when God calls us to give in ways that might seem stupid or incompetent or irresponsible, God gives back, outdoing that seeming stupidity or incompetence or irresponsibility with his sheer abundance and showing us that actually when we give in obedience to God's call, it's never stupid. It's just sometimes hard to believe in at first. It is the Holy Spirit, the living water flowing in the river of God, who both changes our hearts to want to be like God, teaches us how to give, and then overflows from us to bring the multiplication of growth and blessing that God desires. So what shall we do? It seems to me that in many ways, how we respond to the call of these values to share generously and receive abundantly will determine how much we can actually fulfill the calling we're discerning to live out the other values that we've explored. Because in order to do any of the things that we've talked about over these five weeks, we will need to use the resources that God has given us we will need to prioritise those who can't or won't prioritise us in return, both the poor and those who are not already part of our worshipping community. And we will need to believe in and pray for and be open to receiving the abundance of God. We'll need to use the resources God has given us. That applies to the PCCs, using the resources entrusted to us in our buildings and the money in the church bank accounts. And rest assured, that when I talk about godly, generous stupidity, I'm not talking about slapdash accounting or reckless spending. But it also applies to our own resources. While none of our churches is in financial crisis, let me tell you that the financial decisions facing our PCCs are not on the whole decisions around how to spend our wonderful surplus. Across the benefits, we're actually running at a modest deficit in order to pay for the things that are already going on and to make a fair contribution to the diocesan central funds out of which come the pay for clergy and maintenance of houses and things like training and safeguarding. So we couldn't be that stupid, even if we wanted to. We are investing in a pioneer worker and potentially somebody to work part time in an operational role across the benefice. But I think it's important to acknowledge together that the PCCs don't have sufficient income at the moment. While there are various things that we can do and are doing to address that, a church's funds are meant to come primarily from the church. Bank statements are a crude measure of our priorities, perhaps, but not a bad one. What would mine say about my priorities? about how generously I'm sharing, about how much I trust in God's provision. But again, this is really not just about money. We also need to make decisions about the things that are going on and all the possible things that could be continued, started, stopped, increased, scaled back. Are we prepared to make decisions that are generous towards others in our benefice family? Equally importantly, are we prepared to be a community who does that without complaining, arguing or grumbling? And even more importantly, are we ready to be what I think these values should make us look like? A partnership in service to all in need, sharing what God has given. How can we shape our church life so that it serves the poor, the materially poor and the spiritually poor, those who don't yet know the love of Jesus? What would it take? Well, of course, we can influence our response to things by resolve, and commitment and practice. But in the end, the mission of God, the generosity of God sent into the world in Jesus and now in us, the body of Christ, this mission is fueled, as we said in week two, by joy. Not by comfort or pleasure, 
but by the overflow of our knowledge that God loves us, knowing that he won't ever let us down, even though we will all let each other down sometimes, not to mention being let down by those we're seeking to serve. Can we be more focused on the goodness of God and less on the anxieties of the world? More focused on the power of God and less on our own limitations? More focused on the richness of God and less on our own perceived scarcity? Can we pray more thanks than requests? On our own, we probably can't. But with God's help, then, to paraphrase so many great men, yes, we can. So we come to the end of this exploration together, these early steps, scouting out the lay of the land, making some agreements about how we're going to travel on the road together and seeing what the challenges and the joys of that might be. And we are still near the beginning of our journey. I hope these Explore groups have been a really good experience, but what happens next is almost certainly more important. Will we be a people who follow boldly and expect regeneration? People on an innovative and costly journey into God's good future? Will we be people who face outwards and worship joyfully, a community on mission, but with prayer at the beginning, middle and end? Will we be a people who pursue unity and embrace diversity, one spiritual family where all people and every generation can find a place at the table? Will we be a people who build connections and grow bonds by investing in new networks of belonging inside and outside the church? And will we be a people who share generously and receive abundantly? A partnership in service to all in need, sharing not what we've earned or thought of, but what God has given and what he will continue to give by the ever flowing river of the Holy Spirit. Will we? Shall we go? Let's go.